I'm going to get started. We're going to watch a video real quick. This is going to be kind of giving us the info about the stuff we talked about um, on Wednesday. So we're going to be looking. We're going to be looking at this, right? So starting out with the receptor, we're going to jump into how it transitions the signal to the receptor itself. That's going to spit up. It's going to go through the spin of the side page. So you're going to see what downstream to so get all the way down here. We're working with the shirts. This is the one where I told you guys I made a drawing or a little figure I was trying to make. Like I say, I was taking the quiz and I was trying to explain these pathways. And I need you to talk about when the system is on, which means the system is off, and how the molecules would be in different states. Right? But it makes someone already know me that it wasn't loading properly. So I loaded it into the Google Drive. It's also back on Brightspace within that section. You guys should be able to open it up. I'm expecting for you guys to improve the figure. Right? So there's stuff in there that the figure's not good. You put that on the midterm, I'll take points away from that. So you guys to work on that one. Yeah? That one's going to be going on. So let's take a look. In the liver cell, when the hormone epinephrine binds to an epinephrine receptor on the cell surface, the signal is amplified so that a single epinephrine molecule can trigger the release of many thousands of glucose molecules into the bloodstream. Each molecule of epinephrine activates a single receptor. However, each receptor may activate up to 100 G proteins, and each of these stimulates the enzymatic activity of one adenylyl cyclase enzyme. The next step in the cascade is amplified, considering that a single activated adenylyl cyclase may convert many molecules of ATP into cyclic AMP. Multiple cyclic AMP molecules bind to the regulatory subunits of the enzyme protein kinase A, resulting in the release and activation of its catalytic subunits. Signal amplification continues as each catalytic subunit of protein kinase A phosphorylates and thereby activates many molecules of phosphorylase kinase. Each of these enzymes, in turn, phosphorylate many molecules of the enzyme glycogen phosphorylase. Each glycogen phosphorylase may then trim off many molecules of glucose 1-phosphate from glycogen, resulting in the release of many thousands of glucose molecules into the bloodstream. I think I should have bought it. You good? Make sense? Remember in the drawing on mine in the beginning, I had some of the notes talking about we're starting the signal all the way at the left, right? Chain of reactions occurs in a liver. So when you're jumping from the receptor, here you have a single hormone coming in. You're going to activate your receptor, right? There you're going to transition from this receptor to that G protein. So this is my drawing for the midterm. You want to be putting your alpha, beta, gamma onto that drawing, right? That's the one we're going to focus on today. When there's amplification, it means that that signal is going to get like hydrogen times this receptor signal to a different G protein. That's one more time you're making that signal stronger. Right? So one chemical signal came in. If two G proteins get activated, you just double per signal. Or whatever the case is, you're multiplying. Right? Same thing here. When you get to the, your G protein, it's going to activate your um, adenine cyclics. While it's sitting there that whole time, that adenine cyclase is going to be able to do its job, like it'll be functioning. So during that time, it'll grab that ATP, cut off the edges, glue it, make a new cyclic AMP. As long as the G alpha protein is sitting there, this thing's going to be consistently working. Right? So again, because you're producing one G protein, you're getting a bunch of cyclic AMP coming out. The big thing is you're amplifying, amplifying, amplifying. Same thing when you guys keep going down the pathway. A chain of reactions occurs in a liver cell when the hormone epinephrine binds to an epinephrine receptor on the cell surface. Okay, I'm tired. Yeah. It's loud. Let's see. No, I'm getting to it right. Keep going, keep going, keep going. So here, I want you guys to make sure you guys had notes that it's that. Your cyclic AMP, right? It's gonna go, you're gonna get rid of this, the repressure domain. Here's your catalytic one, right? As long as your catalytic is active, it's acting like a kinase, it's phosphorylating. That means again, you're amplifying the signal. From here, it's um, what's it called? It's uh it's transferring the, the phosphate groups, helping to this kinase basically giving it to produce this new molecule, 
right? But we're actually now using that phosphate. You, you have a sugar chain. That's like, this is your, this is, I say this is your sugar. <coughs> it's being linked up to your following sugars. And this is happening hundreds of times, thousands of times. And that's what they can do with your glycogen. That phosphate's going to come in, it's going to get glued right here. By doing that, it's going to split this chain open. And now we've released a glucose molecule, right? So when we get down to there, you only want to find it by one. So every phosphate you're bringing in is being transferred to one sugar molecule going up. Um, so I want to see the multiplications. And like I said, I want to see these two different states. When stuff is off, Stuff is on, right? Yeah. So the catalytic is uh, has a kinase function for the phosphorylase kinase, and then the phosphorylase kinase and the glycogen phosphorylase they both just transfer their phosphate. From, yep, they're transferring. Catalytic subunits. Signal amplification continues as each catalytic subunit of protein kinase A phosphorylates and thereby activates many molecules of phosphorylase <coughs> kinase. Each of these enzymes, in turn, phosphorylate many molecules of the enzyme glycogen phosphorylase. No, you're right. Multiplies here, multiplies here. Okay. Yeah. So the each they're all kinases. Yeah, so it'll be like once this enters the, yeah, it starts activating this molecule. This molecule, as long as it is phosphorylated, it'll keep sending more signal out. So another amplification making this guy. Each glycogen phosphorylase may then trim off many molecules of glucose one phosphate from glycogen, resulting in the release of many thousands of glucose molecules into the bloodstream. Think good about this? Yeah. All right, so now this is the big long story. Right now we're gonna super zoom in and we're gonna go look at how that G protein works. And in this case, they just showed us it was splitting. Now we're gonna look at it, how it's like, depending on what partner it's working with, it has a different task that it'll do, right? Or a different function, yeah. Just to double check, the, the glucose phosphorylase, that, that one just transfers its phosphate. Yeah. Okay. I didn't put the numbers on that one. I believe it's a transfer. She said many, but from what if I remember, it was supposed to be a transfer. So it should have been a one to one. But find that data for me. Yeah. So give me that jump right here. Is it a one to one going from this um, the glycogen phosphorylase, or is it multiple? Yeah. You can use the book. You can do um, Google search. You can Wikipedia. Yeah. Support your argument. And then this is one that's like, hey, if I was wrong in the midterm, you argue against me, you get the four points for it. Yeah. Awesome, guys. Well, that'd be cool. And one day we can argue about it. You guys ready? Yeah. So Monday we're going to chat about it and let's see who's right. Um, so make sure you support your argument for that one. Yeah. Everyone's good? All right. Cool. So let's get back into this guy. So now we're going to be focusing. <laughs> Is there any chance you could add the link to that video or that website to the PowerPoint so that we can go back and look at it? I'm not sure if it lets you open it. I don't know if you could, it should be there right now. You you say it's in one of the PowerPoints right now. Yeah, it's in the- it's Today's in, PowerPoint? Uh, yesterday's, or my, uh, Wednesday's, it's right here. Oh, okay. But I'm not sure if you have an account with that thing. Try it out, let me know. Otherwise I'd have to try to, uh, Put it on YouTube, make it private, and I'll send you the link, but I can't post it because I think it's like intellectual property for their stuff. Um, no, it lets you go to the website. 
speak in open it? All right, cool. I have videos and they're normally they're hidden inside the, all the PowerPoints. There's videos for all this stuff. Whenever you see this uh, learning link, just click on it and you should be able to open up the videos. There's one more at the bottom of this lecture too. Back to this guy. So G protein coupled receptor and the G protein, right? So the thing, the big thing about the G proteins is that they, they basically bind a guanine, right? That's gonna be the big thing. Right? That's the one that we normally use to make our DNA. A T C G. That's the G that we're talking about. Right? They're gonna be able to bind it in two different states. We'll kind of go through the uh, depending on whether you have a GDP confirmation or a GTP confirmation, they behave differently. The other big thing we're going to talk about today is going to be that G protein coupled receptor. So in this case, now we're talking about the purple. Right? So remember, this is the one that's doing the big, like most of the big work of <coughs> we're sending a signal to a cell. It's coming in from the outside, and we need to be able to know that that signal is specific to be sent to us. Right. So the shape of the receptor bound to a specific target. Once we have that information that hey, it's time to get the signal turned on or send it, keep sending the message. This confirmation will change since the input to here. And on the inside, here it's going to be performing its job working with the G protein to convert it into that active state. You know? All right, so like I said, we're going to be bringing up these two components the G protein couple receptor, what's going to happen with the activation. And afterwards, I'm going to go into how that G protein ends up transmitting its signal downstream. So, for this, the things you got to know is there's a lot of these G protein couple receptors. You don't need to memorize exactly what tissue they go through or what, what's the signaling molecule, but basically it's kind of like I was talking about. The signaling molecule would basically be that like little green component. Epinephrine has a specific shape. It'll then go and bind to a specific receptor. If you guys look up any of these molecules, look them up online, compare two or three of them against each other, you'll see that they have like slightly different functional groups. They have slightly different shapes. And that's the mechanism that allows these molecules to go all around your body but each one of these will activate a specific cell type and it'll only, it should be doing that same type of response when it gets to all these tissues. So, making sense? Feeling good? All right. So let's zoom into it. This is our cartoon version, but this is actually, if we look at the amino acid chain, this is what it actually looks like. The big thing about these is, when we used to talk about them, was there was this key feature that they keep finding on, which was that they had seven parts of their chain that actually went through the transmembrane. So remember those, they're expected to have those hydrophobic amino acids. It's gonna help trap it inside the plasma membrane. Your N-terminal side is the one that's sitting towards the outside of the cell. Right? That's the one that is gonna help us recognize our specific target. On the inside of the cytosolic side, um, we have the C-terminus, and then this is the one that's gonna be helping us interact with the G protein. All right, so in an inactive state, if this thing's unbound, right, we don't have activation of the G protein. Once it shows up, the signal's present, what's gonna happen is we're gonna switch the way that this molecule works on the inside. There, it's gonna act as a guanosine exchange factor. Remember, there's gaps in the gaps from the last slide. What that means is that this is gonna have a molecule of GDP, and it's actually gonna help us switch it out from GDP to a brand new GTP molecule, and that'll be the active state. Once this alpha subunit is holding onto the GTP, it messes up its ability to interact, or it decreases its affinity for the beta and gamma subunits. That's what causes the release, the release of the alpha. Right? So the whole point here is we need to see the alpha subunit go when the signal is on. So again, we're going to start up here. We're in the off state, right? Everything's kind of together, alpha, beta, gamma, alpha, beta, alpha, beta, gamma. It's one single complex with a GDP, aka it's not working. The receptor binds, activation, there. This GDP gets kicked off and a brand new GTP comes on. Right? So in this case, it's a complete swap. Now you have the active state. In this case here, we can see now we're going to dissociate these two these two proteins from the alpha subunit. Now, in this case, it's either one of these 
um, either this complex or the alpha subunit, they can kind of use their own interactions with other molecules to keep sending the signal back. Right? Um, the one that we've talked a lot right now is going to be here where we're talking about epinephrine. This is where it goes to give them these cycles. If this has its own targets as well, this can also hit multiple different. As this is going on, right, this gives us basically a time frame where you get the hormone, you get the alpha subunit activated. In this case, even if this molecule leaves and you get rid of it, the lifespan of this gives you a basic window of how long you're actually going to be seeing them. Right? That would be the thing that would be the, 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 the power of, 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 sorry, the length of your signal. Um, it's going to be affected by how long this thing survives. If you need a signal that keeps going on continuously, then it depends on what's happening with the hormone concentration, right? I want a signal to keep going, that means I have to keep giving it consistently hormones so that we keep activating the alpha subunits. Once they're active, we're gonna have inside of us an active mechanism that's trying to basically turn them off. That way it allows our sensors to be responsive to the environment. If something changes, we get a new hormone, we're gonna to respond to it. Here, this RGS is going to be that big player helping us with that. At which point, in your GTP, it loses the final phosphate group, right? It went all the way to the outer edges. This brings it back into that GDP confirmation. Once it's GDP bound, it'll again bind with the beta and gamma, giving us those three subunits, and you're basically back to the off state. If you want the signal to keep going, you need to again send it another new ligand, activate the pathway. We get a brand new GTP, we can go through the pathway. Once we lose the phosphate, it goes back to the offset. That should be pretty good about this one. Yeah? All right. So for this one, give me one second. Talk a little bit about secondary messengers, right? So there's our extracellular component giving us that initial signal. We're working through here, getting that G person activated. Now we're going to activate the dummy cycles. At this point, that second part of that, of that signal is basically coming in here, which will be this is the next part of how we're actually signaling within the cell itself, right? In this case, we're looking again at uh, cyclic AMP. So remember. This one before, and that little drawing had three phosphates. We're basically going to kick two of them out. And the last one is actually going to loop back into the sugar itself. This is the same. Right? That molecule is again regulated by, it normally doesn't exist. This molecule pops it into existence. This thing isn't that stable. That brain, when it makes itself, it has a lot of pressure that's kind of, it's unhappy with. You're going to have, um, it's basically going to mess up this molecule and it'll turn off the signal, right? So it doesn't have it on until we bring it into this pathway, but it easily turns off. So in order to keep signaling, we need to keep producing. And for this one, like I said, that big job's gonna be that we have to have an alpha, alpha subunit, it has to have the GDP bound to it, and that's the only one we can activate, that's, that's the only way to activate the dummy cycles. So that's the only way we can keep making the cyclic AMP. So in an off state, we should pick up a bunch of ATP, when the system is turned on, we're going to pick up a lot of the cyclic AMP. Another cool thing about this is that um, the cyclic AMP is a really powerful tool, right? So right now, the, the epinephrine signal is basically telling us, like, hey, we're low on energy, right? That's the goal. So, hey, we don't have enough energy. We need to get some sugar to come out. So this cyclic AMP actually, if you look at it, it has the ability to signal into a, a, a bunch of other different pathways. This is just one of them. In this case, you have it signaling to break that glycogen, which again would be those chains of those sugar molecules attached to each other into individual single six ring carbon rings, which we can break up and make sugar into ATP. Um, the, that cyclic AMP normally that signal also breaks off into different pathways that help us in different aspects of the metabolism of how we're gonna break down that sugar. So it's like a broader signal it opens up. So here we're looking at how it actually structurally looks. 
This is like uh, this would be like your basic ATP. They just drew it vertically for space. But you can see there's your first phosphate, second phosphate, third phosphate. There's your carbon ring. Right. Um, what's going to happen is we're going to remove these last two phosphates. There, we're going to have that. This group is going to react down here. It's going to link up, and now we have that cyclic AMP ring. Right. So this is basically the way we're going to turn the signal on. And it doesn't last long because this is going to be the thing that's going to come and try to stop it. That cyclic AMP phosphodiesterase is going to, again, cut that interaction. And now you have this AMP, right? A with a monophosphate. This shape is the one that actually can go and activate different things, gives us different signals. Once we're in this form and it's already been, um, like you remove the ring, it won't be able to work like this anymore. And at that point, we basically turned off the signal. All right, so here, again, it takes it down primary signal, we're getting to the secondary signal. This one's going to give us a big broad range, and then this is what we've been talking about right now, right? We're going to get ourselves all the way down to, we're going to break glycogen into different sugar molecules. All right, so here's another branching point. Once we get to here, cyclic AMP will bind, get rid of this repressor domains, take them out, and then we leave behind just the catalytic, right? Those are the cutters. Normally, we follow it to go to the PKA, go to the phosphorylase, and heterolase, and glycogen. Here's how the same molecule will go and chase like a tangent pathway, right? Something that's also going to help us out. In this case, it goes into the nucleus, and it's going to be working down here. It's going to be using ATP to phosphorylate these guys. So these are your first to start down here with the DNA. You have your uh, cyclic AMP response elements. So you guys remember this? I want you guys thinking about like when we're doing gene expression, we're talking about enhancers. That piece of DNA that really tells us when, where, and how much of a gene you need to make. Whatever gene, it has this basically yellow sequence inside of it. Once we activate it, it's going to get bound by this, which will be your pre binding proteins, right? It'll be this, guys. They'll recognize the sequence, but that binding, the interaction with the co-activators, is all dependent on that phosphorylation. Right. So in an off state, you wouldn't expect them to be phosphorylated. You're going to mess up the interaction with DNA. You're going to mess up the interaction with the activators. They take the signals off. Once the catalytic is available, we can phosphorylate it. We have DNA interaction. We have this protein protein interaction helping to activate. work with the co-activator, aka we have a co-activator. We can make the signal go ahead that polymerase, right? or the mediator to hit the polymerase. Uh, but that's the goal. Now we can turn on the genes. So. There's a library of genes that have these sequences in front of it, and that's what really gives us, again, a big branching point of, we technically just had a catalytic domain come in, but at the end of this, we basically created, we can target a bunch of different genes at once. The cool thing is, if you need a bunch of things in the pathway, like different molecules to help you cut the sugar, process the sugar, um, remember, like, we have to break down the sugar, it coils back on itself, then you break it into two, three chains, like for the, um, Mitochondria, right? Like remember from pile one thirty three, we had to cut the sugar down. All those enzymes, it's like their ability or, or how you have them. A lot of them are going to be using this information to kind of set them up. Like, hey, we're we're in a sugar making mode. We need all the tools in that pathway to be activated so we can make a lot more. And then, so this will be one, one pathway where we can kind of branch off. The other ones, we're going to be looking at this side. This will be the similar kind of molecule, secondary molecule. The G protein can move, then it can off. And I'm about to show you guys how we're going to activate on this side. For this one, we're going to, work, we're going to be looking at now, basically, it's like you have this, this um, it's like a sugar down here. And here, you basically, you have a lipid, right? There are your two long carbon chains. There's your glycerol and your phosphate groups. But the big, big thing here is your fatty, and there's your sugar, right? This would be sitting around. This is the, um, I'm not going to say that, but PIP2, right? This would be in the off state, right? Now that you have this phospholipase CB, it's going to come in. 
you can see it's gonna actually gonna cut it and we're gonna reduce, we're gonna release this part, this IP3, and there you're gonna leave your fatty acid behind, right? So in this case, again, what we're talking about, um, let me see, I was jumping already from here. Your signal came in, this seven transmembrane receptor, right? Your, your G protein couple receptor, it's gonna activate your G protein. Your alpha subunit is going to become that GTP version, aka now it's working. It'll go, and that's it's going to help you with um, the activation of this activated phospholipase CB. Right? Its activation is going to do that little cut that we just talked about. There's your fat, there's your sugar. You kept your fat there, your sugar gets released. Right? This sugar then is going to go, it's going to move to your ER, and then here you have a second receptor. This guy. Right? Same properties that we talk about for receptors, extracellular domain, which is made specific, that's going to recognize the IP3, right? When it recognizes, it's going to change conformation. It's basically, you can have this thing be in a closed state. You signal it bind to it. You put it into the open state. And now just through osmosis, right? Where you have higher concentration, it's going to be pushing itself towards the lower concentration. You can release the molecule. In this case, it would be the calcium. And then the calcium will then lead to downstream signaling, like different proteins depend on different molecules to make them function better. Like for the DNA, our polymerase, if we don't have magnesium, the DNA, the polymerase itself can't transfer new base pairs when we're copying the sequence, right? So just like that, there's a lot of calcium dependent proteins that the moment you release a signal, the calcium gets popped up, pumped out, that will bind to these proteins and now that'll be like a way to activate it. Now those proteins will do their catalytic function or whatever targets they need to work with. All right, here we go. So activated, released. And here, this would be that protein that we're talking about, right? Activated protein kinase C. In the off state, it doesn't have calcium. It can't do its job. In the on state, calcium comes in. It's gonna bind. And it's going to get like, I almost want you to think about it. Do you guys remember what we're talking about enzymes? You have like, you can activate them from a different site. That binding ends up changing the conformation and helps them work somewhere else. And that's where we have this kinase function coming in. Here's another group, right? So in an inactive state, we're looking at comodium. So this would be two different little proteins. Inactive state, once they get active, activated by binding to the calcium itself, they'll be able to switch in, in the way that they function, right? So this will be a, uh, a kinase that kind of depends on that function. So you can see that calcium activates the commodium and it gets us to this guy, the commodium dependent uh, kinase. Switching between the two states. Calcium is gonna be getting pumped into the ER. So that'll be the long-term way of we need to turn the signal off. Once all the calcium is gone, the signal will be turned off. If you want the signal to be turned on, we need to go back to this state. The signal has to come in. We have to have the uh, we have the G protein send the signal, release that sugar, and then pump the calcium back out. So again, that'll give us the ability to control when it gets turned on. Calcium getting pump, pumped back away is the way to turn it on. All right, sounds pretty good. Yeah. All right. Um, so for this part is. The secondary messages I've been talking about how they have their way of getting turned off. Here we're talking a little bit about how the G protein itself can get turned off. Um, in this case, remember the goal is that it's activated when it has a GTP, so three phosphate groups. Now what's gonna happen is instead of switching them out, it gets used up and it's gonna remove one of the phosphate groups, giving us that GDP. And now that GDP conformation will be the one that stops it targeting your molecules for the different like uh, thinning cyclase or any of their targets, and then it'll reassemble with that alpha beta gamma. And again, we're back to the off state and we reset the signaling, leaving it sensitive to whatever's gonna happen. The really cool thing about this is like, this thing's happening, it happens very fast because all the molecules are there and they're existing. This outer part is they all are kind of sitting on an off state just waiting for something to happen. When the signal comes in, your cells can easily switch off the receptor binds, send the signal to the G protein. G protein just switches job, switches one molecule, it can go start working. The moment you want to turn it off, it kicks itself back into the sleep state, the receptor can kick itself back into the sleep state. So it's a lot faster than the simple pathway where it's like, 
some molecule came over, told us to make a DNA into an RNA and an RNA into a protein. Imagine we still have to go to the ER and try to put sugar on it and ship it to the compartment. Super slow processes, right? But because of that, these are super useful. We use them in a bunch of stuff like regulating sugar. We use them for sight, for memory, for vision. Um, it's like for regulating like metabolic pathways. So super powerful stuff. All right. So if we're kind of zooming out on things that we can control. We can mess around with the G protein, zoom out more. We can even mess with the receptor itself, right? But again, not destroy, uh, like not to destroy it, just to basically turn it off a little bit more. In this case, is you're gonna have pathways that kind of activate, and these these are basically gonna put kinase like phosphorylations onto the receptor itself. That phosphorylations end up binding into this protein called the arrestin, and the whole point of the arrestin is you're gonna block its ability to interact with the G protein coupled receptor. So normally they do this and it's pretty cool. It's like the cells use it when they wanna sense something and they wanna be very sensitive to the environment. Right? So what they'll have is they'll have a bunch of receptors. If you give it a certain amount of chemicals to it, that thing will try to keep answering that call and keep giving you the same response. Like, hey, there's a chemical, chemical, chemical. But when your goal is to eat something, the theory is that like, not the theory, but the thing is, you're putting your molecules are diffusing from that organism, and when you get closer to it, it basically has higher and higher concentrations. So, if you imagine, like, if I'm this far away from that system, and 10 units of whatever chemical they're putting out, or like I could smell it, then when I moved a little closer, I might be in a region where there might be 20 or 30 of those units. At that point, all around me, I would have my receptor saying, Hey, there's food all around you, like it's everywhere. If I got a little closer, again, I would keep getting tricked. So, the trick is. In this case, I have the receptors, they're sending the signal, and they'll be like, okay, I felt a certain amount of signal in this environment. You're gonna temporarily turn off these receptors. So now it's like, even though there is 20 or 30 units on my surface, I divided the amount of receptors I have. So it needs me to be still sensitive to that environment. Like, no, no, it's stronger here than behind me. As you get closer, it does the same thing. We sense your receptors, you put less of them, so you're kind of feeding for, for, for less of the environment. Um, yeah, so it's pretty cool. And basically, this pathway is like once you activate it, it'll bring this up. As long as this thing is staying there, trying to stay active, it'll end up building up the mark and building this guy. The other way to do it, which is a little bit rougher, is messing where you find the receptor itself. So, this one, what's going to happen is you have the receptor sitting on the surface, right? And then if it's getting activated, you'll actually grab those molecules and you'll pull them into the cell to make a little vesicle. When you put them into those little vesicles, this is where they can basically get this vesicle. It can get transported to the lysosome from the lysosome, which is gonna chop up those proteins and we're gonna resend them back so we can remake new stuff. So that's one way to permanently get rid of the receptors and it, uh, it'll make you permanently desensitized to a certain chemical response, right? Just because whatever receptors are left over, you're technically gonna have less. Part of this pathway though is you can also just temporarily put it into an endosome hold on to the receptor for a while, your, your ligand is basically gonna dissociate, you're kind of just sitting around, this will be turned off, and afterwards you can return that vesicle back to the plasma membrane, and it'll put the receptor back. So you can have this temporary, like a pause switch, where you hold it in a bubble, or you can internalize it, send it to a lysosome, and you'll get rid of it. And that way you'll be more sensitive in the future. Um, here, this is the one that we talked about above, it's kind of like, you can put things that block the pockets below, and that would be like what we're talking about, like the arrestin, right? If you take away the domain that it normally uses to do a job in sending signals, you block it, and you basically block the signal itself. Um, from this part, it'll be, um, I'm not gonna go too heavy into these because I need to draw way more complicated chains, but it's, you can have molecules that once you activate a pathway, a lot of them have ways to say, we don't want a signal to be permanent, so it tries to turn itself off. So part of that positive response of like, hey, the cyclic AMP is trying to get us all the way down, sorry, the uh, epinephrine, the goal is to get it down all the way to the glycogen. Some of those pathways have little branches that come back and regulate different aspects, right? One of them is we can mess with the receptor. One of them is we can mess with the other signals. Like we can actually mess with the G protein. We can mess with the deadly side phase. One of the cases you can make 
brand new proteins or brand new molecules that purposely interact and they'll block the function of the downstream targets. Yeah. All right. All right. Cool. Quick job today, guys. Any questions? Not right on the cards, and then I think we're good to go. <clears throat>